Good morning. I want to welcome you all to worship on this 25th Sunday after Pentecost. Is that right? 24th. Whew, almost. Tempest Fugit. Thank you for being here. Um, so a couple of announcements. First, I want to thank uh, John Eckerd for filling in for us this morning. Wayne's a little bit under the weather, but uh, John was quick to respond, and we appreciate you, John. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I do want to draw your attention to the announcements in the bulletin. Um, Jan, anything we need to know about the Christmas dinner? No, just more week coming. Okay. Tuesday, December 5th. Uh, do we need to let anybody know in advance or just show up? Show up. Just show up. Captain's Galley, December 5th, 630. Uh, of course, today after, after church will be our poor man's auction. Uh, this is our uh, largest fundraiser for our youth of the year, so I would encourage you to come and join us. It's, uh, I don't know, how long has Miller's been doing this? This has been quite some time. Anybody know? I don't know. I've never been able to figure that out, so if anybody knows when it started, I'd be interested to hear, but um, anyway, there will be an auction. There's lots of... Uh, Goodies that have been donated, I'm sure some baked goods as well as some other things. So come over and have a hot dog and some beans with us and help support the youth. Um, so next Sunday, next Sunday will be our annual church congregational meeting. We have some business to do. Um, so among those, uh, as you heard, uh, our nominating committee chair, Doug Yoder, talked last week. Uh, we're going to be appointing some or electing some new members to council. As it stands, we don't have a name for every seat on the council that will be open. Um, those seat openings are open because several members of our church council have hit their term limits. And according to the Constitution, they must step down. That means somebody else needs to step up. So, if you are feeling called... If you think you might have gifts that could be used for the good of the business of our church family, please contact Doug or me or the church office and we can talk about that. <clears throat> if we do not have people to serve on council, it's hard to do the business of the church. So, please pray about it. All right. Um, Several weeks, oh, uh, the 26th, the 26th is the Sunday after Thanksgiving, um, because I have gone to great lengths to try and spend Thanksgiving with my whole family, including my older son, uh, as uh, God has put great friends in my, in my life, I have a colleague in Charleston, in the NALC, who has agreed to do a pulpit swap with me. So I will preach at Pastor Jones' church, and you all get to hear Pastor Jones preach here. Pastor Melinda Jones is one of my favorite people in the NALC. I wish I could be here to see your faces when she preaches. She is amazing and energetic and a wonderful woman of God, and I think you all will very much enjoy having her with you. So... Um, just enjoy that, and then we'll get back to normal on December 3rd. Uh, the 10th will be our annual children's program, Christmas program. Um, anything else we need to say about that, Jan, or more details to come? The kids will be getting letters about it. Yeah. So the Parish Ed Committee is going to send out letters to you all about that, so just stay tuned, but plan to be here that day. That will be the sermon, so you don't have to listen to me. And they're way cuter than me anyway. So, all right. Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Bonnie, welcome back. It's good to see you. I'm sorry I didn't see you all the way back there. I guess that means you're feeling better, but it's, it's definitely good to see you. Is this, this is your first Sunday back since the surgery? Yeah. Good. Glad you're here. Thank you, Jane. Excellent. Are there any other announcements for the good of the church family? 
Council tomorrow night at 7. Okay. Seeing no hands being raised, please take a quiet moment to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Confession and Forgiveness, found on page 56 of the Green Service Book. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment to reflect on your sins as we lay them at the foot of the cross. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our entrance hymn is in With One Voice, number 776, one of my personal favorites, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, show mercy to your children who humbly pray that we who have no confidence in our worth may not be judged but tenderly received. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Are there any children that would like to come up for a message today? Good morning. Good morning. All right. I have something with me this morning. Can anyone tell me what these are? Flashlights. Flashlights. How many do I have? Two. Two flashlights. What do flashlights do? They, they bring light to, to things. Yeah, they bring light in the darkness, don't they? Yeah, and you turn them on to get the light. So if I press this button, we see the light turns on, right? So the blue one works. Let's check the red one. Uh-oh, I don't think it's working. It's dead. it's dead. What does it need? Batteries. Batteries. You are so smart. So let's put the battery in. Let's see. Maybe it'll work now. If the vicar can get it in there. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> it works now. Oh, and it shut off. Well, <laughs> maybe not the best, but okay. So, as flashlights shine in the darkness, Jesus told a story one time. He told a parable, and he was telling about ten friends that their friend just got married, and they were going to have a huge party, but the friends needed to wait outside in the streets but it was dark and it was nighttime. And back then, they didn't have street lights or flashlights or maybe, has anyone used a cell phone to get a flashlight out of that? Yeah? Or any other things? Yes? Like, a, like one of those like, torch, like torches? Yeah, they used an oil lamp. Yeah, these look different than our lamps today, don't they? Yeah, they're made out of clay, and you put oil here, and it would burn the oil, kind of like how a flashlight uses a battery to light up. They would use this oil and fire. 
And so these ten friends, they waited outside, and it got really late, so they fell asleep. And when they woke up, five friends were smart, and they had a jar with extra oil in it. But the other five didn't have an extra jar. So what were they going to do? Because it was going to get dark, right? And there was no street lights or anything. So they had to run off to try to find more oil because they couldn't take the oil from the other ones that had theirs. And so when they were gone, their friend came by and he showed the and he opened the door and he helped the friends go inside to the wedding party. Who's been to a party at a wedding? And it's went kind of late. Has anyone been to Yeah, those are fun. <laughs> And he shut the door, and when the friends came back, they missed their friend. So they didn't know where to go. They, they couldn't get in, right? And so what that tells us that we need to keep in mind that Jesus wants us to know is that he will provide for us what we need, right? Whether it's a battery or he will give or make sure that we have enough oil. He'll give us wisdom to know that, right? Or just anything really that we can trust him and we can pray for him and he'll help us through it so that we can shine our lights and be ready for whenever he comes for, He comes back and we get to join that big party, right? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for always providing for us, giving us faith and love for you. Help us to shine the light and love of your son into the world this week. And help us to trust you that you will always provide for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. First reading is from the fifth chapter of Amos. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll now sing Psalm 70, responsively by whole verse. Be pleased, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those who say to me, aha, and gloat over me turn back, because they are ashamed. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say forever, great is the Lord. But as for me, I am poor and needy. Come to me speedily, O oh God. You are my helper and my deliverer. O oh Lord, do, do not tarry. The second reading comes from the fourth chapter of First Thessalonians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers about those who are asleep, 
that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you will know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As many of you are well aware, last Sunday was All Saints Sunday, which is a time to remember our brothers and sisters throughout the church year who have departed to rest in Christ. This Sunday comes after All Saints Day, which is actually on November 1st. And All Saints Day is a time to remember and honor every saint throughout Christian history. And now when I say the word saint, you may immediately think of people like St. Nicholas or St. Patrick. But Paul actually addressed the recipients of many of his letters as saints. So I guess in all actuality, I could have began this sermon as saying, to the saints of Miller's Lutheran Church in Hickory, North Carolina, but I digress. Yet, Paul does mention in his letters that all Christians are called to be saints in Christ. You, me, and all those who are given the gift of faith are gifted with sainthood. And All Souls Day, which is the day that follows All Saints Day, is a day to remember and give thanks for those saints who have transitioned from the church militant to the church triumphant, in which... I think it's safe to say that all of us have several loved ones who come to mind that this applies to, and not just from this past year. As you all know, my dad is one of those saints at rest. 
And I was with my dad when he made that transition in the early hours of the morning. And after returning home from hospice, one of my mother's friends, who is actually a pastor's wife, came to the house. She was a true comfort and help during that time. And I am still grateful for all she has done for my family. And I remember speaking with her in the kitchen and mentioning the epistle lesson that we read today. And for a little fun fact for you all, this letter, 1 Thessalonians, is believed to be the earliest letter that we have from Paul. And we can actually see a glimpse of his journey with Silas to Thessalonica in the 17th chapter of Acts. Their mission was successful, and many people, Jew and Gentile alike, became believers in the true king, Jesus Christ. But of course, as there is nothing new under the sun, there were those who were threatened by all these new believers confessing that Jesus is Lord. The church was accused of defying Caesar's rule over the Roman Empire, which, as you may guess, led to intense persecution. Paul and Silas had to flee the city as a result, but there was something curious that was actually happening. Even though Paul had left, and the intense suffering continued to befall the Christians of Thessalonica, the church was still flourishing. The Thessalonians were growing in their love for Christ, their love for one another, and yes, even their love for their enemies. Paul soon writes to reconnect with the church and encourages them in their strife to be true rebels in a cruel world. As Christians, we are called to swim against the current, note the chosen reference, to love and serve others even when times get tough. The Thessalonian saints were a marvelous example of this call that we should emulate in our lives. But I think it's important to note that this still doesn't mean that they didn't struggle with questions from time to time. They wondered things like, when is Jesus going to return and put an end to all the suffering? What about our brothers and sisters who have died in the faith? Many of us are being martyred for his name. What is the hope that we hold as saints in the kingdom of heaven? Many questions that I believe all Christians find themselves asking at one point or another in their faith journey. Paul addresses the church's questions with gentleness and affection. He calls them brothers, as he often does, and uses a peculiar term for those that have died. He says that they have fallen asleep. Now, why use this term? Well, for Christians, death and grief is not quite the same for us as it is for the rest of the world. God has given his people something that sets them apart in their grief. And that thing is true hope. Death is now like a rest with a promise attached to it of a future awakening. Think of it like God set an alarm clock, but we just don't know when it's going to go off. <laughs> when the world sees death, they see it as a finality. But my brothers and sisters, God has given us the gift of his promise that it will not be so. We have hope, whether it is for our own deaths that we will inevitably face, or that of a loved one in the Lord. This hope is not something that we can strive to attain, but rather it's a promise that we can rest in. A promise based on the work of Christ for our salvation alone. Death did not have the final say over our Lord, and we are baptized into Christ, and it is Christ who will have the final say over our eternal destiny. Yet the Thessalonians still had more questions. Are those that are sleeping in Christ, will they be at a disadvantage on that day? Will they miss his return somehow? Paul quickly assures them that we will not precede those that have passed but we will all witness and greet our Messiah together at his return to the earth. This is a word from the Lord. It is no mere opinion or speculation of his, of Paul's, but instead it's a promise from God himself. And just think what a spectacular experience that will be. 
One commenter observed that a loud shout will sound like a commander to his soldiers, hearkening the arrival of Christ. And the person doing this cry will no, most likely not be an angel or any other celestial being, but it will come from Jesus himself, ushering in his own return. An angel will sound the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will be the first to rise, and we will join them as a part of the welcoming parade for the coming king. And now, if you've seen the Kirk Cameron Left Behind movies, verse 17 probably paints a certain image in your mind of like piles of clothing being left everywhere and people flying through the air like Superman or Super Saiyan. But that is not the image Paul is demonstrating for the Thessalonians. Clouds in the Bible were commonly associated with God's presence. And I don't have enough time to get into all the occurrences right now. But I would encourage you to take some time and observe all the times God's presence was indicated by a cloud throughout the Bible. And as far as meeting the Lord in the air, I think it's best to quote one commentator who's echoing what I've read from many biblical scholars. Quote, The air is considered to be the abode of evil spirits who will yield the place to him who has all authority in the heaven and on earth. And if you don't believe me, Paul also uses this illustration of the air in Ephesians 2. Now, if you've drifted off, stick with me. I also am going to bring out an illustration that someone once told me when it came to this very notion. What, pray tell, surrounds us at this very moment? What are we currently in right now? Air. <laughs> and the Greek word that's used for meat for when we meet the Lord, is used in greeting royal dignitaries. Jesus is really returning to this earth, and several passages point to his return occurring on the Mount of Olives, the very place where he ascended, where we physically, with our physically resurrected loved ones, will greet the King of Kings. All evil that has wrongfully plagued and ruled this world will be forced to step aside and be judged. Our reunion with our king, along with our brothers and sisters, will never end. And as Paul notes in verse 18, no matter what grief or hardships that we may face, this is very encouraging. An encouraging hope and grief can seem like a wild concept at first glance. When my dad died, I remember being encouraged with verse 13, specifically by our family friend, which states... But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. And I commented something to this friend along the lines that I was thankful to have hope in the midst of a really traumatic time in my life. And our dear friend smiled and said, yes, that is wonderful. But it's important to remember the sentence doesn't end with do not mourn. The passage says not to mourn as those who have no hope. Some Christians tend to think that it's noble not to cry. We shouldn't allow ourselves to be sad because we know that our loved one is free of suffering and they're with Christ. We know that they'll be resurrected at his return and we'll live with them forever. So what is there to be sad about? But hear me clearly, that's not the point of the Christian message when it comes to grief. We are still to mourn. We can still be sad and miss them terribly. We can still ask God all the questions as to why this had to happen. And if he is strong enough to defeat death and resurrect our loved ones, then he's strong enough to shoulder us through our grief. And I believe what Paul's encouraging the Thessalonians to do is not to fall into despair. Down the long tunnel of grief, there is a light awaiting us all. This passage has become a major source of comfort in my own grief and questions. And I hope that you will walk away from this today with it being one of yours too. I find myself returning to it often. Like, for a quick example... When I was in college, I worked in the office for the doctor of ministry program in the seminary. When we would have seminars, 
all the doctoral students would be on campus. And many of us would just be running around doing various tasks while one person was charged to sit in the office in case anyone came in needing help. And on this particular day, I was the one sitting in the office alone when grief hit me out of nowhere. And I turned to this passage for comfort, read it, and then I had to walk down the hall into another room. And while I was in this said room, I heard a horn blow. And now my school was near Main Street, so I didn't think much of it at first until it kept going on and on. And I soon started to realize, man, that sounds like a shofar. <laughs> so hearing this literally like 10 minutes after reading this passage had me looking out the window, because who wouldn't, to see if like, I don't know, Jesus was descending on a white horse or something. <laughs> but it was business as usual outside and the horn eventually stopped blowing. So as soon as I stepped out into the hallway, I stopped and spotted one of our students holding a shofar. And I wanted to say to him so badly, dude, don't blow that in here. It, this is a seminary. People will start to get excited. <laughs> After my initial disappointment that Jesus was not yet returning, I did tell my coworkers, and we had a good laugh about it. Grief, sadness, and hardships are going to be present in our lives. But that won't be the end of the story, will it? One day, an angel... One day, Jesus will shout, and an angel will blow the trumpet of victory, signaling Jesus' return. All the saints from every generation, including you and me, will cheer as our conquering king returns in glory to judge the living and the dead. He will heal the world as heaven and earth are reconciled together again with no more pain, no more suffering, and no more death. We'll get to live forever with our God and the saints of all generations, including those who are persecuted in Thessalonica. And perhaps I'll even get to tell them my silly story that I just told you. And who knows? Maybe we'll all have a good laugh about it in the end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
Let us pray for the faithfulness of the church, the life of the world, and all those in need. Everlasting God, your son promised he would return to the earth one day. Help us to be ready for his return, that our lamps would be lit and our hearts would be open to Jesus' second coming. Remind us that because of our faith, there is nothing to fear and everything to look forward to, as Jesus will judge us innocent, having taken our place on the cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, ruler of all, you desire that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Let your blessing rest on our civic leaders and all whom you have placed in positions of authority, that your people may lead quiet and peaceable lives, godly and respectful in every way, free to pray and work in your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, grant favorable weather for all the farmers who are bringing in the crops this season. Watch over them and prevent accidents or injuries as they work around large machines. Provide for our daily bread, and make us truly grateful for all we have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, as a sign of your holy reign, grant that this congregation will identify with the suffering, the sorrowing, and the sick in both our local and global communities. By your spirit, empower us to seek ways to serve and reach out to those on the fringes in loving and tangible ways. We pray especially today for those on our prayer list, those we name now in our hearts. And those known only to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, help us to consistently care for the leaders and pastors of our church, partic particularly Bishop Dan and his staff, Dean Steve, Pastor Nelson, Pastor Henry, Vicar Rebecca, and your servant, as well as all clergy in the Carolinas Mission region. May we continue to lift them up in prayer for their own well-being and for the well-being of the whole church. We thank you for their presence in the church and in the world as beacons of light and hope to a people in need of your peace, your presence, and your strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, be with our brothers and sisters whose congregations are discerning the call for a new pastor. Especially, we pray for Mount Calvary and Grace Lutheran churches. Assure them of your Holy Spirit's presence throughout the call process and guide us to be good neighbors to them during their transition. Bless their interim pastors as they lead them through this season of change. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 534, Now Thank We All Our God.
Come over and join us for lunch, please. Go in peace and serve the Lord.